We're continuing on our study of the book of Luke in Luke chapter 5. And it's a very beautiful, beautiful passage. I think many of you are familiar with some of these wonderful stories that you get from the Gospels and from the Gospel of Luke here. And I call this sermon, Fishing with Jesus in the Sea of Souls. Fishing with Jesus in the Sea of Souls. You know, you're surrounded every day by a sea of souls, many of whom do not know Christ. Even Jesus, as he was coming to the Israelites, coming into the Judean home country, many of those people were rejecting him. They were not even believing God. They were maybe doing the outward forms of religion, but they were not even believing in God's grace. And so even Jesus was surrounded by people that needed to be saved. And he was all about that. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. And we're going to go through this bit by bit as we read through our chapter, but we'll take it a couple sections at a time. Let's read first verses 1 through 11 of chapter 5 together. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. So were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore left everything, and followed him. (laughs) Here we see Jesus as the great fisher of souls. And he's recruiting others to come help him. That's you. You know, Jesus could have done this single-handedly, right? I mean, he is the son of God. He healed people. He can save people by dying on the cross for their sins. He could have called people with the Holy Spirit just all by himself. He didn't need your help to do that, actually. But it's interesting that in his kingdom, in his economy, he's recruiting disciples to come with him in this mission of fishing for souls, in this mission of having compassion on people, helping them, seeing them healed, praying for them, loving people, bringing them into the kingdom, then teaching them, discipling them, growing them up in the faith. He has recruited disciples, that's you, to join him on this mission that he's on. He is not... He's not afraid to touch the leper. He's willing to heal, as you'll see in just a few moments in the next verses. Uh, He's willing to heal and to forgive those who come to him by faith. Anyone that you bring to Jesus and that comes in faith, he is willing to heal and to forgive. He is eager to save souls. And he is recruiting you in this process with him. Are you willing to be used by Jesus to bring fish into the net, so to speak, to bring souls into salvation. He's recruiting some fishermen at first. (laughs) James and John, two brothers, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, right, who are kind of two fishing teams that work together. These two brothers and their fathers probably before them that were working on these boats. And so he uses this analogy as he recruits these first disciples uh, for this mission of catching souls. He says, from now on, You'll be catching people. Then it says they left their nets, which meant their livelihood, all that they knew, really. They left their nets, they left everything, and followed after Jesus. He was calling them to himself to be saved, to be forgiven, to worship him as their God. But he was also recruiting them to help him on his mission to bring salvation to the world. It's a very beautiful thing. They came to him in faith, And they would also learn how to bring others to him in faith. 
I have a question for you this morning. Have you come to him in faith to be healed and forgiven? And do you know what it means, what that looks like in your life for Jesus to also use you to bring others to himself, that they also might be healed and forgiven as well on this job of fishing for souls? Jesus, the master, of fishing, uh, master fisher of souls, is recruiting you. And this is not just for apostles, evangelists, and preachers, you know. Um, he's recruiting his disciples to help him on his mission. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you're part of the recruitment. <laughs> he wants you. You're part of the process that he is using to have compassion on the souls of the hurting in this world, to show love to people who are not used to get, being shown any love in this world, to bring the message of salvation and forgiveness of sins to many, even to see healing as God wills. We also must leave everything to follow after Jesus and accompany on his mission and his plan to save the world. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be used by God in any way that he would want to use you on this mission that he's on to seek and to save the lost? You know, if Jesus appeared to you and said, I want you to open a business in Morocco. I want you to be a missionary to Maryland. I want you to teach at a school in Afghanistan. I want you to open a nonprofit for street kids in India. You know, would you leave your non-immediate family and sell all your possessions at a yard sale and go? You know, what if he said, I want you to do ministry in Utah? You know, what if he said that? Something crazy like that. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to do anything is really the question if the Lord asked you to do those things for him. You know, and the answer to that determines your daily answer to the call of Jesus. You know, every day he wants you to do things for him and for his glory. Are you willing to do that daily? And in the same token, your answer daily also <laughs> helps determine your answer, your, answer, your answer on a global scale as well, right? The big decisions that you will make in life. If you're following Christ daily, then when the big decisions come, you're ready also to follow him. And because you've made that big decision, you also are committing yourself daily to following his call in your life to do ministry to others and to share his compassion with others. We should be willing to sell all of our possessions and give them to the poor who will have treasure in heaven and follow Jesus on his mission to fish for souls, whatever that looks like. We all should come to him and say, everything I have is yours. And sometimes he says, okay, good. You keep it for now, but I'll let you know what to do with it, you know, as he wills. Sometimes he says, okay, I want you to rearrange things a little bit here. You sell off that, sell off that, keep this stuff, move this stuff around, and follow me in this fashion. <laughs> Sometimes, like the rich ruler that came to him, he might say, on this particular occasion, just sell it all at a yard sale and give it to the poor and come follow me. You'll have treasure in heaven. We should be also willing to do that as well. You know, and we've discussed kind of what this looks like in the daily life of a Christian when, when Jesus is calling you to also be a fisher of people with him. I think it looks like two things in the life of a believer. Number one, it does mean that we should be willing personally to share the gospel and able to do that, at least if it's in the form, at the very least, your own testimony of how you came to know Christ with any person who asks. You know, Peter tells us that each person should be willing to give a reason for the hope that is within them. Each person should be willing to tell someone about Christ when they say, you know, I've been studying Christianity. I want to know how to be saved. I'll give you five minutes. Go. <laughs> you should have something ready. Again, even if it's only your own story of how you came to know and to love and to trust Christ and what he's done in your life. I think that's number one. But number two is that we should all work together as a church and as the body of Christ on a larger scale to bring the gospel to the world. That's why we do things like you know, send other missionaries out to other places, you know. Maybe you can't go to Cambodia, but we can send Katie there this summer, right? You know, you can't get on a plane and travel and, and share the gospel with seven billion people in the world, right? But we can work together to see that happen, right? And so each person has a role to play. Maybe we put on an outreach event here, and whether you're the one speaking at the outreach event or you're the one setting up the chairs, the roles are equal because we're all working together to see people come to Christ, right? Where we're all working together in this, you know, this example that he uses of fishing for souls, right? Maybe one's pulling the net, maybe one's getting the sails ready, etc. 
but we're all working together. I think that that's what it means when Jesus is calling us, recruiting you as a disciple to be a fisher of souls with him. But he takes it a step further, and you get, this, you get the first example here in Luke of a soul that they catch together. Jesus is willing to touch and cleanse the outcast. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Let's read verses 12 through 16 together. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are, un- if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I love that. I love that statement that he makes. I am willing. (laughs) Be clean, right? This is a first example of a soul that he catches for himself. You know, if you're a fish and you get caught, it's not such a good thing after that, right? But if you're a soul and you are caught by Christ, everything begins to go uphill. You may suffer many, many sufferings, but you know that you're headed for an even better place, right? Compassion drives Jesus to do what others would not, which was touch a leper. If you had leprosy in those days, you were a social outcast. Maybe they would even make you live outside of town in a leper colony. You could not go into the temple. You know, in so many ways, you were separated from your family, perhaps. You were considered ceremonially unclean, but you're also highly contagious with these type of skin diseases to where, I mean, it just... As of necessity, people could not be around you. You could only be with other lepers, right? And you should not, if you, if you touch, in the Old Testament law, if you touch something or someone that was ceremonially unclean, you also would become ceremonially unclean until sundown, until 24 hours, basically. But Jesus does something very interesting here. <laughs> he reaches out and he touches the leper. And I think this is to demonstrate something very beautiful that the leper was not going to make Jesus unclean, but he touching the leper was going to make him clean, right? This, this osmosis, so to speak, of uncleanness could not enter Jesus, but cleanness would go to the leper. He healed him of his disease, and he was also healing him spiritually, I believe, as well. You know, And leprosy, I mean, it, it represented a number of skin diseases back in that day, that word. But it may be as represented by AIDS today or something like that. If, if someone has HIV, right, you may be reluctant to touch someone with HIV. I remember when I was in high school and we would go to uh, a certain home for folks and, uh, and many of them there had HIV. They were, they were very um, afflicted with many different things. And many of them actually had HIV. I remember being in high school, kind of an immature Christian, you know, and I was like, ooh, hey, how are you doing? You know, like... Just didn't, I didn't even want to touch somebody with HIV. I remember thinking about that, um, and that was, that was wrong, actually. Later in Uganda, we also met people with HIV. This was later, I was more mature in faith, you know. And a lady with HIV asked me to lay my hands on her and pray for her. And filled with the Holy Spirit, I had n- absolutely no hesitation to do that, you know, and to pray for this woman. And God, God did some neat things in that context, actually. And so I think God is also calling you to reach out and touch people that other people would consider untouchable or people would not have compassion on because, you know, they put themselves in that situation. They're not, they're not worthy of charity. They're not worthy of, you know, relationship. They're not worthy of love. They're not worthy of salvation, maybe even. You know, I don't know if they should come to church even. We're commanded to reach out to touch those people in Jesus' name. However we can, however you can have compassion on someone and to see Christ's grace transform their lives. That's what Christ is calling you to as well. And I think each one of us as his disciples must heed that call. We must be ready and and willing to extend the love and compassion of Christ to any place and any person in any situation. You know, do we even see the crippled around us, right? You know, do we even notice that they're there, right? You know, you might say, well, I'm not, I'm not a racist or I'm not 
prejudice against poor people or people who have been in prison. You know, but when you're really honest with yourself and you look at your own sinful heart, you start realizing, you know, all kind of stuff that's there that you didn't realize, right? And you have to address that in the Lord. And you have to repent of those things first, of those own barriers and, and hindrances in your own heart. And then you will be able to go out and love others where they're at, right? See, it's like, it's like you're almost even ignorant of what's really going on in your reactions to other people at times. You know, somebody, another brother was telling me about um, ministry he was doing, and, and through that ministry, someone who was in prison came to faith in Christ, you know, and uh, this person was getting out of prison soon, so he had arranged, you know, yeah, you come to my church, you know, as soon as you get out of prison, and uh, we're going to disciple you, you know, we'll help you get back on your feet, you know, this kind of thing, you know, and the guy shows up at, at, at church, you know, his first Sunday out of prison, and you know, everybody gives him the cold shoulder, and it's just like, pfft. You know, he feels very, very unwelcome at church at all. You know, and how, how is that a testimony of the love of Christ that can heal the leper, that can heal the sinner, anyone coming from any context, right? I hope that if, uh, you know, the ex-con fresh out of prison walked in these doors, you would throw your arms around them and hug them and kiss them and say, you're welcome and we're glad to have you here. We must extend the compassion and love of Christ. That's what he's also part of what he's calling us to do as fishers of souls, right? And number three, Jesus, he always responds to desperate faith with forgiveness and healing. Here's another example, example number two in Luke of a soul that they catch together, right? Let's read those last verses 17 through 26 together here. One day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, "'Friend, your sins are forgiven.'" The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. This is a, this is a remarkable account, actually, that even the Pharisees and the scribes repent on this occasion, and they praise God at Jesus' miracle and everyone in the house, it says, praises the Lord for his grace in this situation. Now, that's a miracle that, that even the Pharisees repented and praised God, right? You know, but these, these friends bring their friend to Jesus, knowing that they have to get this guy to Jesus. This is his only hope. He's, he's paralyzed. He's not able to work and make money to support his family. You know, his only hope is to get to Jesus. They know that in faith. So they take him on the mat. Maybe there's four of them carrying, you know, each corner of the, uh, of the stretcher, so to speak. And this house is packed full with people. There's people flowing out the door. There's people looking in the windows already. They cannot get through. But they say, aha, I have an idea. Let's go up on the roof. Jewish homes had roofs that you could walk on. And maybe they just had to remove some, some tiles or some dirt and sticks to undo that roof above where Jesus was teaching. The dirt starts falling down as Jesus is teaching on everybody's head, maybe even on Jesus' head. Dirt's coming down, maybe little sticks, etc. And all of a sudden with ropes, this man is lowered down in front of Jesus. And it's clear to everyone, apparently except Jesus, what these people want for this paralytic to be healed. But what does he say to him? He says to him, first, your sins are forgiven you. Why? Because it is not physical healing that people need first and foremost. It is spiritual healing that people need first and foremost. And then 
the physical healing also can follow. Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. And immediately the scribes and the Pharisees start saying, wait a second, I mean correctly, only God can forgive sins. Who does this fellow think he is? He's a blasphemer, right? The error in their logic was ruling out the fact that Jesus was God, right? And as God, he actually had authority to forgive sins, right? So he has the authority. He has the authority to forgive sins. And he says to them, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? What do you think? Which is easier to say? Well, it's kind of easier to say your sins are forgiven, (laughs) you know, because if you say get up and walk and he doesn't, then you're you're kind of, you're shown to be what you are, right? A fake. Um, But in reality, it's actually harder for someone's sins to be forgiven than for someone to get up and walk. Maybe a doctor could come up with a, surgery that could heal a paralytic and they could get up and walking it's actually harder for someone's sins to be forgiven than for them to get up and walk but jesus does both he says but so that you may know that the son of man has authority to forgive sins i say to you the man get up and walk take your mat go home and he does in front of all of them even the pharisees repent and praise god at that point you know it's time for you to go out on a limb for others sake as well right desperate times call for desperate measures. When you're trying to bring people to Christ, when you yourself are trying to go to Christ in faith, you know you need to get to Christ for yourself. And you know you need to bring that other person to Christ as well. And you look, there's not a way. The door is blocked. The windows are blocked. Try the roof. However you can, you must get yourself to Jesus and you must get others to Jesus as well. It is their only hope as well. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you have some friends or family members who need Jesus, who need forgiveness and healing this morning? Hmm? Heck, maybe you need some for yourself this morning too. (laughs) Go to Jesus. Get them, however you can, however you can, get them to Jesus. Jesus can heal. Jesus can forgive. Jesus can rebuild what was broken down. He can bind up the wounds. He can make someone whole again, but they must get to Jesus by faith, even desperate faith. When you're hanging on by your fingernails, that's okay. I remember Dr. Krabendam, whom some of you have met, talking about uh, his first pastorate in California at an OPC church there. It was a small church. He knew they needed to grow in many ways unhealthy, and he said, I have to do something. I have to do something. So he just started going door to door, sharing the gospel in that town in California, Northern California. And, uh, you know, door after door, it was just people slamming the door in his face, you know, no thank you, no thank you, no thank you. And uh, he was getting desperate, and he cried out to the Lord for his help. And as one of the lady, he knocked on one lady's door, and the door opened just a little bit. She looked out, you know, and he said, I'm so-and-so, I'm here to share the good news of Christ with you. And the door began to close again. But just prompted in the Holy Spirit, he stuck his foot in the door and he looked in inside the living room and he said, he saw four people sitting on the couch and he said, I see four coffins. The door opened back up just a little bit and she said, what do you mean? He said, because without Christ, you're dead in your sins. She opened up the door more and said, come in and tell us more. (laughs) Sometimes you have to stick your foot in the door. You have to take a risk for the Lord to reach out and love people. You know, sometimes when you're trying to reach out to other people, they don't even want you to reach out to them. They don't want your help, right? But they need, you know what they need. They need Jesus. You have to, in faith, somehow get them to Christ and get Christ to them, right? Whatever it takes. Jesus wants us to be healed by him and to bring others to him so that they might receive healing as well. You first fall down at Jesus' feet, just like Simon Peter did, right, and say, you know, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. You know that in your sins, you could not even stand before the Lord. But you're also bringing others to Christ. And he actually says to you, at the point when you fall down at Jesus' feet and you say, depart from me, for I'm a sinful person, you know, it's then that he actually says to you, come and join me. And from now on, you'll be catching souls. Amen.